All right, hello and welcome to Slim DevOps number 74. Uh, I am Peter, uh, co-host and uh, head of growth here at Slim.ai. I'm joined as always by Nina, my wonderful co-host. Nina, how are you doing? Hello, doing pretty good, better now. Better now, yeah, yeah, yeah. You were dealing with some uh, some illness. Seems like it's going around. So you're feeling better. You're 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 back on your feet. Yes, happy to be a little bit healthier. I was um, in New York over the weekend at a wedding, so I think that's where I caught caught the bug. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Traveling definitely goes there. Mm-hmm. I have a I have a young child, so we're just perma sick these days. So that's uh, that's my world. But <laughs> it's awesome. Well, when well, you're not recovering, what have you been uh, What have you been working on? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I've been thinking about some blog post uh, drafts that I want to get into. Um, one of them is about like open telemetry, AWS Lambda, how we are leveraging those tools with um, at Slim. And so I've been doing some research on open telemetry. Actually, I saw an intro to open telemetry uh, with Raw Code. So oh, okay. <laughs> our special guest today. Yeah, we can we can ask him all about that. The Raw Code Academy. Yeah, yeah. We've got a great. Great show today. We're going to be joined by Ivan Rockcode here in a minute. Um, open Telemetry, pretty cool uh, open source project for observability. So a lot to learn there. Um, something that we're using here at Slim. Cool. Nice. What about you? What have you been up to? Uh, I have been doing my security best practices. So I am uh, getting ready to go to RSA, which will be at uh, towards the end of the month. So um, joining actually a pretty cool little. Um, uh, event that we're going to be doing there with uh, Insight Partners. It's called the Scale Up Lounge, and actually the special guests are Sugar Ray. Um, I don't know; they might be a little before your time, but Sugar Ray in my day was like way big. They were like all over MTV and really, really awesome. Fly was their big hit. I won't sing it because I don't want to one scare away our entire audience. I was about to say I'm ready to listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to hear my singing voice, but if you come to the event. Uh, uh, you know, I would be happy to sing along during their their mega hit fly. Um, but yeah, it should be a good time. And so for anybody who uh, might be at RSA or is just based in San Francisco um, and you might want to come see Sugar Ray and hang out with us, feel free to drop into our Discord channel. Uh, we're at slim.ai. You can find the link um, at the website above my head. Um, and yeah, we'll be uh, we'll be doing a big run up to that. We have a bunch of invites to this to this scale up party. So, um, you know, come hang out with us and, and check out some, you know, mid 90s uh rock music uh that that i'll be a big fan of so awesome well sounds good well why don't we uh bring in our guests here we uh are are joined today by uh uh, not just rock code oh look this is like the super transitions i'm just making new engineers (laughs) appear out of midair so uh david welcome ivan welcome how are you guys doing Yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm doing a really good. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm just so blown away by that transition. I'm going to have to steal that. But no, I'm really good. I'm excited to be here. I'm looking forward to talking tech this evening. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you the story behind that transition is that our uh, once co-host, Martin, who set up all of these streams and has now moved on to working on NixOS projects, um, gave me all of these scenes. And we've never had four people on until we did the canonical uh ubuntu chisel containers and so that was a new scene so i've always had three and now i have four and now i have four guests on all the time which is awesome so that's the uh the uber nice. transitions yeah and ivan your first time on stream with us um we've done a couple webinars together but uh your first time on twitch how are you i'm doing well as well and uh, i'm really happy to be here it's uh, kind of exciting i'm always uh like watching you folks, and now I'm finally a part of it. So like, I'm super happy to be here. Nice. Well, we are very happy you are on stream with us. So um, Ivan, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll go to David. David can introduce himself. So uh, uh, tell us who you are, what you do, and, and, and how you're connected to Slim. Of course. Uh, well, I'm a software engineer uh, here in Slim. Uh, and uh, it's kind of hard to, to tell exactly what I'm doing. Because like we're a small company and uh, we can wear different hats uh, sometimes even a few times a day. So like most of, of my time, of course, I'm spending dealing with low level container stuff, uh, like various debugging, container runtimes, optimizations. But sometimes I'm also like having some fun on the backend or doing some more SRE related stuff. 
Um, and of course, sometimes I talk to our partners. That's it about me, I guess. Nice. Excellent. And David, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, of course. Uh, my name's David, which we've covered. I'm in <laughs> Scotland, although I don't sound that Scottish. I'm not sure what happened to my accent, but I've been working remotely for so long now with international <laughs> people that I just I don't know what my accent is. In fact, sometimes my wife will actually bang the door and say, what voice is that? Because she doesn't even recognize it. <laughs> I've been a software developer for like 20 years, um, and I've spent the last 10 kind of really focusing in the DevOps world. Um, handling cloud migrations, containers, Kubernetes, and the last five or six years trying to do more educational stuff at DevRel. So speaking of conferences, building up my YouTube channel, the Rockwood Academy, and uh, I'm a bit of a masochist and I enjoy fixing broken Kubernetes clusters. <laughs> nice. nice. I asked Ivan if he could if he could teach me Kubernetes and he told me he didn't have time <laughs> yet, but uh, he is also working on some great tutorial content on Kubernetes. So hopefully we can all we can all take that. That's great. Um, and I'm just realizing that every time that I've ever scheduled a meeting with you, I thought you were in Dublin and not in Scotland. So uh, my apologies for always sending you Dublin time now, realizing that that was my mistake. But... <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, I mean, Scotland's best city, Glasgow. <laughs> <laughs> nice, it's amazing. Well, yeah, well, welcome to the Slim DevOps Twitch stream. So we talk, uh, like like you said, David, and, and I mean, we talk low-level container stuff here on stream. We're always kind of working on containers, getting into containers, um, looking at how they work in CICD pipelines, how they work in Kubernetes, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and David, we had asked you to kind of like help us out, like look at Slim Toolkit, give us some feedback on it. That's our open source project. Look at the Slim Developer platform. That's sort of our, our SaaS platform. Um, and you've prepared a few things. So what are we going to be kind of walking through today? Yeah, uh, today we're taking a look at Slim Toolkit. So I kind of gave my my fresh eyes on Slim Toolkit a little bit of a scary tour. Um, just trying to work out how to use it and what it does and what the value proposition is. And to be honest, it didn't take long to really see the magic in Slim Toolkit. And I'm kind of excited to share that with people today. Um, I've got a handful of demos that just kind of run through, you know, one contrived thing that I feel everybody needs to see. Uh, and then a couple of more real world things that I could actually generally use in my own production infrastructure um, that I just thought were interesting as well. I've got to say, like my experience of using some toolkit has been, it has been interesting and fun, and all the right places, which is amazing. So. Awesome, awesome, good to hear. And yeah, Slim Toolkit. I'll say, um, you know, so people might know it as Docker Slim. That was the name that it had. Uh, our co-founder at Slim AI, Kyle Quest, created it back in 2015. Um, we recently renamed it to Slim Toolkit. Uh, there was always a little confusion with Docker in the name and stuff like that. So we, we renamed it to Slim Toolkit. We've also been adding a lot of cool features to it. Um, Ivan, do you want to give like kind of a quick uh, what's been going on with Slim Toolkit recently? Because you're working on that project all the time. Well, <laughs> yes, sure. Um, like my the most exciting like thing that i kind of delivered to this part isn't that exciting for external customers i guess because what i did recently or relatively recently uh, i implemented a kind of e2e -E testing framework that um, tests the core functionality of it so it takes the sensor like the piece that produces this application intelligence that we use then to build these uh, optimized images and I just wrote a bunch of um, different uh, tests that like execute these sensors in very different uh, uh, scenarios. And of course, it's just uh, it's not just about happy uh, flows. It's uh, also a lot about um, exercising various like edge cases solution uh, like use cases. And um, yeah, it's kind of cool because now we have um, like lots of tests going on and. Um, they not just run i also sometimes run them like with the uh, n greater than one and works like sort of shotgun uh debugging of this thingy because sometimes it passes from the first run but fails like every every now and then and then when you run it like 10 times in a row 
then you can chase some really sneaky race conditions. That was really cool to debug. Cool. Sounds like it's like 10D chess or something. So <laughs> that's awesome. It's like the Monte Carlo of end to end <laughs> testing uh, for containers. Oh, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> very cool. Very, very cool. Um, awesome. Well, sounds good. So, um, David, I think what you had said was we are going to do um, an Nginx example uh, to start, kind of the, the default sort of hello world example. Um, and then we'll get into a Rust CLI that you, uh, for a project that you support called Dog, I believe. And then we'll be actually be looking to slim the, um, the Raw Code Academy website, which should be kind of an interesting and fun um, example. Is that, is that right? It's pretty close, yeah. So <laughs> the Nginx is the contrived example. You know, we all consume container images from Docker Hub. We don't really know a lot about them, potentially. And so I wanted to kind of just use Slim against something, you know, there's no Docker file, it's just a container image and, and see one, does it minify it? Does it still work? Obviously there's the security stuff that we can talk about in more detail as we kind of explore, but you know, it removes stuff from the container image and improves my security posture, which is all really cool. And that's probably just enough like for people to take notice, but um, Dog is a, a really cool Rust application uh, that does DNS queries. It's kind of a replacement for Dig. Uh, but has colored output and it's running Rust. Like, what more reason do you need to just use that instead? Um, and again, it was like a third party application that already has a Docker file. I can't go and modify their Docker file. So I was like, okay, let's just lean on Slim to do what Slim does and give me the output that I want. Um, there's a demo that you missed out, and that's fine. It's because I never really told you about it, but I've got a gRPC one as well. So a lot of stuff that I do personally. Um, I'm not a big fan of RESTful APIs. Mm -hmm. gRPC to me is it's kind of where we should be going, especially in cloud native and microservice architectures. And to me, it's really important that the tooling that I'm bringing in with my, my clients or my own infrastructure has to kind of support that use case as well. So I was like, okay, how do we slim an image where we haven't talked about probes yet and people may be going, what's a probe? I don't know. Um, but you know, we need the ability to trigger the application to run under normal circumstances so that the sensor can detect which components are used and put them into the image. It all gets very complicated. Ivan can handle all the technical fluff, but we need to get that into the container image. And I was like, well, how would I do this myself? So I've got a demo of that that uses Postman to kind of run a collection against it. And it's like the simplest gRPC service in the world, but still shows that you can take these kind of workloads and run them through the slim process, which again is pretty cool. And then there's my my website, and I this is the first project where I kind of control everything from like the like commit to the production deploy. So I wanted to see how Slim embedded itself into there. And there were two really cool use cases that I kind of want to show. One was the ability to use Slim Lint to actually get advice on how to improve my uh, Docker file, which was cool. Um, but then also the ability just to actually do the rebuild um, and slim that container down and harden it. Um, and I think it really excels at showing how the HTTP probe part of it works and pulls in all those assets. So yeah, I had a really fun and pleasant experience and hopefully we can show that to people today. Awesome. awesome. Well, that sounds good. Well, if people have questions, uh, feel free to post them in chat. Nina and I can can field questions as uh, you know, as David and, and Ivan go through the kind of the kind of tech talk. Uh, Nina, any questions from you on the demos for 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 David or Ivan as, before we get into it? Um, no questions, but I'm excited to to see, you know, what y'all are going to show me. I haven't seen any of this before, so it'll be pretty exciting. Cool. Yeah, I have questions about gRPC, but I'll save them for that part of the demo. So let's. <laughs> I just realized I've been muting all of you instead of myself when I coughed. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I was eating pretzels on a call earlier. That's like, why, why do they go quiet when I cough? <laughs> Well, that's okay. Coughing is allowed, as we've already established. There is stuff going around here and across the pond. So, um, but all right, yeah. Why don't we? Uh, why don't we get into it, David? So we're bringing up your uh, your coding window here, your your um, CLI. So uh, your terminal window. Sorry. Um, yeah. Why don't you take us away? Okay. So let's start with that first example, the contrived one, and that you're a developer, you're shipping stuff to production. You don't have a lot of information about it. You want to do what you can to one, minimize the size, because obviously ingress and egress costs on the cloud are expensive. 
and we also want to improve our security posture and we don't know what is in the, the image could be a shell we're not sure but we can obviously confirm some of these now, the first thing i'm going to do so we have a internet basis image which is 142 meg and do a run dash dash rm dash ip i will just execute a shell where we are now inside of a container image. Mm -hmm. I'm going to call. So uh, right away, like this is, you know, if you've been in the container ecosystem for a while, we've got some red flags here. The size actually isn't that much of a problem. You know, I, I've, I've seen images that are tens of gigs. So when I see one that's 100 meg or 200 meg, I'm actually okay with that. But I think we can do better. Um, a shell is good or bad, depending on where you're coming from, right? Like. I am actually one of convenience, and I really do like shells and my production container images, but usually I put the shell there rather than rely on, on whatever the operating system has included for me. And, and Slim actually kind of supports multiple ways of working with this as well, which I found really cool. So what we want to do is we'll just start by using the Slim CLI to go work its magic on Nginx. I'm not really going to give it any flags. I'm not going to ask it to do anything specific other than do a Slim build where we can provide the target of the image that we want to work against. And we can provide a tag like so. Um, and there is a shorthand syntax for anyone watching who's going, why are you typing all that nonsense out? Where you can just pass the image like so. But we can just do a slim build, pass the Nginx latest, and it goes away and does stuff. What I found interesting here is that by default, it kind of assumes that it's a web application. Um, so Slim does have this concept of probes. There's the HTTP probe, there's the host exec probe, and there's the container exec probe. I don't know if I've missed any. Ivan can feel free to, to jump in. Um, but I think that is the, the three probes that are of the... Yeah, those are, are the most important ones. Like, indeed, by, by default, um, well, not, not by default, but um, we see if there are open ports. And if there are some, we try to probe them, uh, identifying some common protocols. So I think we can even do something like uh, like PHP FPM kind of probe, which is very uncommon one, unlike HTTP. Um, but HTTP is a super common protocol. So if we detect that one of the ports is actually responding uh, over HTTP, we just try to well send there are some basic uh, GET requests. Um, but there is more to it. Um, we even try to detect um, uh, open API specifications. And if we find one, we start crawling this uh, spec, uh, trying all the endpoints with different methods. And this, uh, of course, uh, may be not enough. But for some applications, it's often like a very, very uh, good, it produces very good coverage. And the whole magic of Docker Slim, it comes from this runtime analysis. Like if you probe your application thoroughly uh, while it's being observed by Docker Slim, uh, you get pretty good uh, final final results out. Yeah, and I think that's amazing that it does all that. I actually had no idea about the Open API, but that's even just like it does just giving me more ideas of things that I want to start doing with the toolkit. But I I just thought it was really cool. Um, I didn't need to tell it to do anything, and I'm going to say magic a lot because when I was playing with it, that's what kept popping into my head. It just does stuff by magic. And I'm a big fan of tools that don't need a lot of configuration, that don't need a lot of reading docs. And, you know, I'm a bit of a hypocrite. Going to YouTube and finding demos and videos, right? The demo should be there to inspire you, not spend three hours telling you how to do a simple action, right? Um, in fact, I always say it when I have conference talks, like, the best developer experience is one where developers are successful from intuition rather than informed decisions. And I felt that Slim was doing that for me, which was really important. Okay, so there's a few things on this output I think we should cover. There's one, we didn't really tell it to do anything except for build. It has, um, and maybe even I'll correct me again here, it runs a container with a volume that has its sensor in it and it runs the sensor. The sensor then seems to fork off the default entry point of command for the container image so that it functions as normal. And then the probes kick in. Here, we're using the HTTP probe because it's the one that runs by default. 
And we can actually see here that it's just doing like a get request against the home page of the HTTP server and actually gets the port from the exposed setting on the Docker file. Again, I didn't need to tell it the port, it just worked it out for me, which was really cool. Because this is an Nginx page, uh, an Nginx default image that just has an index.html, um, you know, we get the request, it was successful, and the probe is done. There's nothing in that that it has to go and fetch any more URLs against the image. Once it's finished, it then does even more interesting stuff. One, we get the results on the size, which I thought were cool. So here we can actually see that we've taken a default Nginx image and minified it by 11.43 meg. So, you know, from 142 meg, we now have an image that's 12 meg, which is, again, magic, right? Uh, it gives us a new tag, nginx.slim, um, and then we have these artifacts down here. And the ones that caught my attention first and foremost were things that are notoriously hard to do in the container ecosystem, which is generate app armor and set comp profiles. And I thought that was just a nice little chef kiss moment. Like, cool, I don't have to worry about this anymore. And so that was awesome as well. I think that's one of the most like unheralded features of of slim toolkit to be totally honest like we don't we don't talk about it about it a ton i know kyle the creator like said that was like one of the main reasons why he started working on the tool is because it was just such a pain to create those two artifacts and they're an output of every single build that you do with slim toolkit or or the slim platform so um, i think it's something we need to talk about a little bit more for sure yeah i mean we're seeing you know, people that are in the Kubernetes ecosystem and following the releases and what's happening with third party components within Kubernetes. Like, you know, we have the set comp operator now, the ability to put these profiles onto all the machines and then have the default set comp profile delivered by the CRI or Docker or Container D, whatever that is. Um, that kind of goes on to stop any malicious activity, but we can do better and we should be doing better because, you know, we write our applications, we understand our applications. We know what we expect it to do. And if we see it doing something that we don't want it to do, we need to be alerted about this. Like, you know, we all, we don't want to be, and I hate to pick on LastPass, right? But they've had some serious breaches in the last 12 months. And like, maybe that is the backdoors and uh, you know, more social hacking than runtime protection. But these are still attack surfaces that hackers are going to be looking for. Second profiles are a good way. Um, even if you don't stop it and you just alert on it, knowing that your application or containers are doing something that they probably shouldn't be doing. So we can run uh, image LS again, and we already know the size difference here, but just so we see them side by side, we've taken a Docker Hub image, we've minified it, we've hardened it, we've secured it. And if we do a Docker container run, nginx.slim, and we want to run bash, it fails. You know, we don't have access to a shell inside of our hardened, minified container image. Yeah, That's something I thought was the, cool. Try the same for the original one. We did, right? I did that. Oh, maybe. I mean, just like it's it just kind of always uh, surprising to me how you can have a shell like, let's say, in an Nginx image. Like, why yeah, on you, earth? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you could run bash, and it's just there. I still think people should have that choice, right? You know, sometimes there is a convenience factor, especially in production environments where debug, the debugging happens in production, right? Anyone that says they're doing it in staging environments is probably lying. In fact, they are lying. I'm pretty confident there. Um, but I was looking at all of the flags, and there are a lot of flags on Slim Build. Like, I spent a lot of time just trying to research and understand what my options were because I'm a tinkerer, right? I call myself like a technology magpie. When I find new flags and stuff, I always go, to go and explore and play with them. I prefer it when I don't need to know they're there, but when I do know they're there, I have to go to the bottom of the barrel and they kind of play with them all. So, um, But we actually have a flag here to include a shell as part of the minified security hardened thing. And I, I like that that choice is there for people that have accepted that they need to be able to debug in production and they explicitly choose it to be there rather than Docker image pull Nginx and they'll say, oh shit, I have a shell I didn't know. Like it, yeah. it's a very big difference between that explicit decision that we have made as a team to have that access to the, the containers in our production environment. So that was cool. Cool. Uh, I'll just break in for a minute and say hi to Kaya, KR and New Rag. Hey, nice. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, give us a give us a follow if you're liking the the content. If you have questions for uh, Rockcode or Yvonne or myself or Nina, uh, please please post them in chat. But yeah, thanks for joining us. Yeah, please keep your questions for Yvonne though. Just 
<laughs> All questions for David. Only really good ones. <laughs> All right, I'll move on to the the second demo then, because that's you know with the, at the engine X, I've seen the HTTP probe. I was like, that's cool, but one of its things that aren't HTTP. Um, and I'm I'm actually wearing a rewrite it in Rust T-shirt, which was not planned or intentional, but I am a big fan of CLI tools being written in Rust. I think they're faster, they're better, um, they're easier for me to contribute to. I've just got a lot of personal investment in Rust that I now prefer tools written in Rust. <laughs> All of that aside. I haven't changed anything in this repository. This was a git clone from GitHub, and there's a Docker file. It's not mine, right? Now I I can modify this Docker file. I can make changes to this Docker file, but that would involve either forking the repository, sending a pull request, explaining my thought process, and maybe it's a niche thing, a one-off thing. Who knows, right? There's all these different ifs, buts, whens when it comes to open source. So let's build it. Uh, Docker image build. I'm giving it a tag of dog fat. This is going to be the big image, the default one, with the Docker context being the current working directory. Hopefully, it's all cached. Good. And uh, we could do a image ls where we grep for dog. <laughs> We've got latest and fat. So I built it two different ways. However, the size is the same, right? Again, the size is not awful, right? Like 100 meg. I'm actually, again, okay with that. That's fine to me. Um, I don't believe it has a shell. I can't remember specifically. In fact, we can just look at the Docker file and see. Yeah, it's got a shell. So yeah, it's it's using, dead now. Yeah, it should yeah Debian it. Buster, right? So again, we have a CLI tool, which again, could have a shell if you want it to, but probably we don't want a shell in this image. Uh, and this one has an entry point. That doesn't mean it doesn't have a shell. It just means we have to thank Dogger for making our lives a little bit harder. Oh no, I forgot run. <laughs> uh, and now I can execute dog inside of this container. But I have a shell, and I didn't choose for this to have a shell. So we can uh, slim it, right? Uh, if I remember correctly, I added a just fail target to this to save a little bit of typing. No, I didn't. <laughs> slim. Ah. This might be new to me. What is a just file? And maybe that's just a, a, a neat fact that I need to get into. Well, believe it or not, just is a Rust CLI tool. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I should have known. <laughs> that is a make file replace. I'm going to have a, a just is so amazing, right? So make files are great, but they have this build. They have this entire premise that they are a build tool for software and that they detect changes and they have build dependencies and they run commands. And if you ever wanted to do just basic task running, then you end up in a position where you end up doing uh, dot phony um, my task. And it's really cumbersome. Not only that, make fails have this hard coded dependency that all the indentation has to be real hard tab characters, I believe, although that looks like spacey. So maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that was a former thing, or maybe it's just GNU make, I'm not sure. Um, but you also uh, you can't everything and here everything under a target is a uh, step that is executed in a sequential order. So that's really cool. But in fact, this is a just fail. That's why it's not a hard tab character. Make fails do have a you have to use hard tabs. Anyway, just fails are different. One we can use like this export export syntax. Uh, to set variables at the top. Export means that it's actually going to export it into the shell when you run any subsequent command, which is very cool. You can define variables with just dog name, and my dog is called Daisy, so there we go. What's also very cool is it has special types of targets. Um, so if we say raw code, we can actually specify a shebang. If this is a Python 3 script, and then from here, I can actually import pretty print from pretty print and run Python code inside of my function. Oh, um, and you can mix and match these. Some of them can be uh, POSIX shell, some of them can be bash, some of them could be Perl, some of them could be Rust, it should be Go, it doesn't really matter. It just gives you this really awesome task runner system that also has dependencies um, that can execute anything. It's just awesome. And then you don't need to ever need to use .40. Is also very, very cool. 
Yeah, my, my, my stake rate doesn't it's always it. help. Sorry? Ponyo doesn't always help. Like, if you have, for instance, a, a folder which just has, like, going size to be named, much like your target in, in your, like, uh, root folder, then you are kind of doomed. And you even Ponyo doesn't help you, and you always have to use, like, minus B capital flag to, yep. to make it happen. Uh, and so not that convenient. Uh, but yes, just uh, just is a very nice tool. Yeah. I mean, oh. One more thing, right? Like, let's just say, who am I? Let's can have a positional argument, which is name, and then we can actually say echo name, like so, which is also very cool. Oh yeah, yeah so I could just is... name David. Probably got that. Oh, I've got it's a dependency instead of positional. Anyway, Isn't yeah. that a, it's an good. interesting command? Who am I? Sorry, I missed that. I was like, is is who am I or in a pre existing command? It is, yeah. Okay. I remember how to do positional, so I'm not going to try and remember it, but they do exist. Just go I to think the. It's just, possible, yes. <laughs> yeah, go to github.com slash Casey slash just, and like the readme is like a huge, massive doc, but it has every different thing you could do with just. And it was very cool. So let's just remove my crappy hacking. <laughs> What was important was we have a just slim, which is going to slim our dog container image for us. Uh, and much like the Nginx, we see a lot of similar things here, but my command that I ran is actually very different. This is how we handle, um, run the slim against containers or applications where it's not web-based at all. I mean, this is a CLI application. So I'm using the kind of more verbose syntax here where I'm saying the target is the original image tag is going to be dog slim and then disabling the HTTP probe and specifying that I want to do a exec file. And this is just a script that I created that is going to consume the application in a way that touches most of the feature branches so that the binary itself is doing all of the work. Um, and as I said at the start, you know, you can do HTTP probe exec file, which is, um, a host based no the container based execution and then there's a host exec file and host exec which does host based commands against the container too uh, if we scroll down what we see here is that it execs uh, it basically does like a docker exec inside of the container and it's running dog in various ways i'll show you that script in a second we see the output and then the inspection finishes, and then we get our minified image. So again, I don't control this Docker file as an open source project, but we've taken what was a 98 meg image and 10, reduced it by 10x almost to get it down to under 10 meg, which again is really cool. Nice. Uh, the script. Well, anybody can throw these together, right? If you know how to use the CLI application, you're just using it. Here I'm just doing an NS lookup, a text lookup, a CNAME lookup, and an MX lookup. Do I really think that these different types of lookups indicate different branches within the code? Probably not, but you know, it's easy enough to throw it together. And um, you know, if this was Docker or Cry Control or anything like that, you'd just be doing like spin up a container, shut down a container, exec in a container, etc., and making sure you cover that um, that surface. So slim, I found it. The, the cool part here is that you don't really need to cover all the code branches. It's not like um, a typical code coverage thingy that uh, tries to uh, like re really go through all your code branches and, and see what's being executed. In case of uh, Docker Slim or Slim Toolkit, it's uh, file based, and your CLI is very like just a single binary. So a single command is already enough to make it included. Uh, a single invocation of the CLI is already enough to get it included into the final image. When the uh, like more thorough probing might be needed is when this um, uh, CLI, say, has some plugin system. And some plugins are being loaded dynamically when some functionality is accessed. In that case, you may want to have this uh, like additional uh, probes to trigger these um, well code branches, if you will. Um, or alternatively, it might be not a uh, a plugin but um, a system library. 
if under like certain circumstances, your CLI to access some fancy networking library, which is not being accessed by default, then you might want to add this uh, extra probe too. Um, however, it's more like an edge case. It rarely happens uh, with real world software. Um, and if it happens, uh, like you always can give it another iteration and improve your probe. Yeah, that's a good, really good point. Uh, you know, I was covering different branches here, mostly thinking about the set comp profile, but you're right from like a static binary point of view, it's not really going to make the container any smaller or slimmer. I guess for uh, interpreted languages such as PHP, Perl, Python, and Node, it may be beneficial to have that really broad scope yep. of commands and execution to make sure that you are pulling in um, any imports and modules and system libraries, et cetera. But for static binaries, you could probably go quite that's that. right you're right uh however for those dynamic uh languages we have some additional intelligence uh kicking in whenever we detect that it's let's say an ogs uh, runtime or a php runtime um, mm. and when this intelligence isn't enough you can also supply some flag for instance uh, slim toolkit is the next aware or next aware and you can actually uh, use a special flag and then make it understand the structure of your next JS application and include everything that might be needed without having the actual uh, runtime problem. So it's like static analysis um, on top of the runtime analysis. Yeah, I definitely spent too much time exploring all the include flags as well. <laughs> yeah, lots uh, of that. There, there was a lot of stuff there, especially for Node.js, you know, I, I don't work with Next and Next directly, but being able just to include a certain directory as well. And I really love the cert stuff um, as well. Like, you know, if you want to be able to make sure the full certificate chain is available and the container image, then there, all the flags are there to do that, which is very cool. All right. Yeah, there's more flags every 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 new build. There's always more flags. <laughs> How the team and Kyle and Yvonne keep up with all the documentation and new flags and what everything's doing is always. Yeah, always but I think it's you know important to point out that the flags are 100% optional. From what I've found, like I didn't need the flags, but if I wanted to start getting into the nitty gritty, they they were there. But I just loved that what I found is I didn't really need. Them. It was more my curiosity that drove me to go and explore and play with them mm -hmm. than anything else. Mm -hmm. So that was nice. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it brings up an interesting point. I mean, I think like the, so what you were just showing is sort of like a proxy for testing, you know, probing and testing are sort of very similar concepts in that, you know, testing, you sort of think like, oh, I need 100% test coverage. So for these error states and stuff like that, that's not really the case, but simple tests or simple exercising, sometimes we say of the container really covers off a lot of what you need to have in the final image. I think a, a pretty common experience with Slim Toolkit that we've heard from users who get into it from the first time is, you know, they, they do like the Nginx example like you did, you know, it's like it works, just works, and, you know, they didn't have to do anything. And then they go to Slim their own app, and, you know, something happens, you know, like say they have to debug something or whatever, and then that's when they kind of discover all of the flags and the concept of probing and sort of how this, like, you know, the more you exercise your container, the better your slimming or hardening output is. And then the more you kind of tune the build, you know, with these flags, then the better that's going to be. Um, and once you find that good balance point, then you just have like a workable profile that works over time, right? And that's kind of a, a pretty normal experience with the open source project. Yeah, what struck me is like, you know, I, I don't work in a lot of like, you know, I, I don't work for a company. I'm not delivering product to end users on a DM by DM basis. But when I was, you know, a big part of our development effort was focused on like acceptance testing, making sure we didn't have regressions before we shipped it to our customers. And as I was exploring Slim Toolkit, that's what kept popping into my head. It's like, if I had acceptance tests for this project, I would just run them against the censored version and it would cover pretty much everything that I need to do. Um, but because I'm a slimy open source hacker i didn't have any acceptance <laughs> test to run against it so. <laughs> that's a quote quote of the stream uh, but no i think that's exactly right and i think like next stream you know like when we get into kind of the slim developer platform and some of the instrument and container hardening that ivan's been built in, building that's why right we want those those um 
you know, those profiles to be built off of things like user acceptance testing, unit tests, end to end tests, those types of things, right? So. Yep. All right, let's jump into the gRPC one. Um, so again, this is not a real production gRPC server, but it does look and feel like one, except it's only got one single endpoint. So for people that are not aware with gRPC and protobufs and such, what we have here is a server.proto, which is a protobuf language to define what a service is going to look like. Um, so we here we give it some options to see when we generate the Go code. One of the really cool things about protobuf is that you can generate code in up to four other languages. Um, we have a package. We define that we have a service called a greeter, which has an RPC endpoint called say hello, which just says world back and return. And then you define the message in and the message out. So here we say that we accept a message, which has some parameter called the name, or at least positional argument one that's called name. Uh, and then we have a reply where we send a message back. We don't actually write any Go code for this. Um, it's all generated for me by the protocol compiler, which is pretty much nice, except for a tiny bit of glue. Um, if we open main.go, we implement this function here that has our return type that just says name, hello world. To build this, um, we need to generate the stubs in the Go codes. We're using the protobuf compiler here, where we say that the input directory is uh, dash the dot forward slash proto. And then I've just kind of done the exact same for the builds and the slim it targets. We, you know, we build the big image just with Docker image build. And then the slim one is pretty much the same as before. I've got my include shell just because, you know, I personally like to have a shell. Uh, I also found the show clogs, which I, I thought was a great name for a parameter, but that shows you the container logs as part of the slim build process, which I found quite useful. We disable the HTTP probe, and then we tell it to publish the exposed ports from the container image, which you'll see why all of these different things are important when we get to that manual probe step. Does that all make sense? Could you maybe show us the Docker file? Yeah, of course. We'd never hate to talk about it. We missed an opportunity for the pre Amsterdam KubeCon April Fool's Day of changing show clogs to just like if you invoke that flag, we could like show like a video of people dancing in wooden shoes or something like that. <laughs> so next well, are year, you all I, going to be at KubeCon? <laughs> uh, two of us will be. My, I, I will not. All right. Play. I would like to see some slimy eye clogs, please. <laughs> that happen in two weeks. <laughs> yes. <Same>. Yes. <laughs> you know, we can make it happen, I think. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Same me up. Uh, so this Docker file. Now, what I did with this example and the, the raw code example that we'll kind of show last is I, I know how to write a Docker file, right? Um, I've been doing it for a long time. I'm good at it. I understand how to make them optimized, cache efficient, and secure, and all this other stuff. But for these, I decided, you know what, screw it. I'm going to go to Google, and I searched for gRPC Dockerfile, and I searched for Node.js Dockerfile, and I grabbed the first one, the first link on Google, which we assume most people are going to do, and I took that image. And you'll see, this is a terrible Dockerfile. <laughs> I, I don't mean... it, it depends, you know, like it depends on your expertise, like for you and maybe for me, it looks terrible, but maybe for like um, people that are less ex experienced with Docker files, they are like, I'm sure great at, at whatever they are doing in, in their programming language, but they are not in DevOps, like up to DevOps game. And then it looks like, okay, there is like a bunch of um, scary looking lines in the Docker file. It must be good. <laughs> like. That's yeah. how system stuff looks perfect. Yeah, that's it, 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 exactly. And at the point I was, you know, I, I really want you to make like, I have experience of doing this. You have experience of doing this. We know what we want a, a good Docker file to look like. But, you know, Docker reported some numbers, right? They've got 5 million active Docker desktop users or something like that. How many of them have been writing Docker files for five or six years or longer? I, probably very few. In fact, most of them have probably been writing Docker files for less than one year, really, if you look at the adoption of developers into the industry and the adoption of Docker. So most people are going to go to Google. They're going to find the Docker file. They're going to copy and paste it, and the job's done. They have a container that works. And what I really love is that Lem doesn't care. 
Like it just comes in and it's like discards it all away essentially and gives me what I need out of it. And I love that people can take these really terrible Docker files and still be highly productive with them and not lose any security posture or be pulling huge images into a production environment by using some toolkit. So you know what? I, I wonder what um, Docker file would look like if we asked uh, Chat GPT to produce us a Docker file <laughs> for a Golang gRPC server. There's your next stream, chat GPT versus Slim. Yeah. There we go. There we go. There we go. I'm, Actually, I'm curious to know, like someone with my background in, in engineering where I didn't have to interact or create a Docker file from scratch, I want to know what makes this terrible. Oh, I'm glad you asked. So <laughs> Docker files are really simple and that we have this text-based format to build container images. But the devil is in all the details, right? Is that every single one of these instructions generates a new layer as part of the container runtime, as part of the build process, sorry. And what Docker is doing is it has a copy and write file system, which means when we say from Golang 1.19, we get a snapshot of their image, which has got Golang 1.19 on it with whatever else is on it. And actually what happens is when we do a run app update app install, is that it then creates a new layer does those commands, does the diff against it, takes all those files and stores them as a new layer. And then at runtime, it merges all those layers together to give you a unified file system, a merged file system. So while a lot of people don't really understand or appreciate, in fact, you'll end up seeing a lot of horrible Docker files, but correct Docker files that look like this, right? Where we chain commands together so that we're abusing the caching and the layering system yes. so that we can tidy up after it before it gets snapshot you think domestically. Um, and you do RM, var, lib, never do this, of course, but you know, <laughs> you, you can do stuff like this to make sure that we're not pulling in too many things that we don't need. We're cleaning up after ourselves, but the Docker files themselves become very difficult to read, reason about, and the caching can be harder to actually make beneficial. Now, a lot of this people don't need to worry about anymore because we have multi-stage builds and we can come in here and start a new layer and cherry pick the stuff that we want with a copy from it. Mm -hmm. But do people need to know all this? No. Yeah, I'm just curious, like, uh, no, no, like does the whole concept of layers, does, like, does it sound important for, for an end, uh, like, engineer who is, like, uh, supposed to be delivering functional application and then someone comes in and says, okay, Docker has layers and it has like an overlay file system that in the end is like very efficient thing that you can like what, do whatever you want with it. Like, I mean, do you care about layers? Like what, what are even those layers? Do I care about layers? Yep. Um, I would say with front end engineering, no. <laughs> exactly. I mean, and no one should, I mean, like, what are those layers? Like, probably the only uh, people who should care about layers are those who maintain container registries. For them, it's like hell important to store images efficiently. And layers kind of help with that. But like for the rest of us, I mean, like why layers? Uh, yeah. Like, yeah, uh, please. Yeah, uh, I was just going to say, uh, Russ Riguez in chat says, uh, those default unsecured huge Docker files are awesome for hackers, though. Every cloud has a silver mm -hmm. lining. So um, I think I think if people are not alone in knowing that a lot of people are going to grab Docker files like this, not necessarily understand them, and then that's going to open them up for, for vulnerabilities as well. Yeah, um, it's a good strategy. You know, stick out all those, those honeypots, like have these compromised versions of libc or tls ssl whatever or not these containers because people will copy and paste them i mean if you search for docker file um open ssl you find a lot of people that pull version 1.0.0 from github and compile it and that looks good because we're doing it the hard way we're doing it properly we're doing a compiling it. it's got to be safe but actually the vulnerabilities there are ridiculous so uh, that's, that was before, a, but, yeah before we move on our, our question for Ivan and, and rock code i think um uh, asks, uh, should we try to reduce the number of layers in an image to reduce the network call to the registry? If yes, what pain points are there in having a large number of layers? That's a tough <laughs> question. <laughs> um, like hypothetically, if you have just one layer, um, it, it could be harder to 
download such an image because it would be just like one sequential stream of bytes. Yeah, you could probably actually uh, that's still a mystery to like to me if Docker uses like uh, HTTP range queries to um, do parallel downloads of a single blob. Uh, it might, um, but uh, normally what happens? You have an image with a bunch of layers, and when you Docker pull it, all of them are maybe not all, but like up to n are being downloaded concurrently, and this uh, speeds up uh, the download. So this is one of the things when layers are beneficial. Um, and uh, the same uh, is true for the upload, of course. If, if you have like a layered image and only the latest layer changed and you want to push it back to the registry, you will push only the latest one. But again, it's all more like uh, on the DevOps side of things uh, and not really about the, well, actual containerized application. Because from my um, point of view, an ideal container um, is just like a box that has your application itself and its direct dependencies. Well, and of course, all, all the transitive dependencies, but that's it. I don't care about layer. It's like a, well, a single archive with only stuff that is needed for my application to run. And everything that comes like in a typical container from all the previous layers, sometimes is just needed for the next layer to run, not for the my application to run. Mm. And then yeah. these layers become a waste. Yeah, I'll be slightly more opinionated than that. Although I think we're both on the same page and just say that like your, your Docker file should have as many layers as possible from a caching and CI point of view so that you keep that CI fast, depending on what changes you only run the absolute minimum number of steps or layers that you need, but always finish with a multi-stage from at the end, which is the one layer that you're going to ship to production, because that's the one that you're going to be deploying over and over and over again. Um, so yeah, have go nuts on the layers. Like it doesn't matter anymore. Make sure you're doing it from a cache optimization standpoint for that CI system, because nobody wants to wait for CI to run for 15 minutes, right? We want it under five minutes, under two minutes, under one minute, if we can get there and yeah, good it's... caching and layering strategies, like have we accomplished that. Yeah, in a way, the organization of the layers is a little bit more important than the like kind of the raw number, right? Like, I mean, as long as you're, you want the stuff that changes the most to be in the upper layers, and you want because that's gonna gonna make your build time fast. It's gonna make things go go faster through yeah. CI/CD. Whereas the stuff that doesn't change <laughs> in the lower layers. Well, stick your build number up here. That's for sure, right? Because you invalidate the entire cache below it. So there's all those little tricks and stuff. <laughs> How to ruin a Docker file in one line. <laughs> yeah, but, I, I mean, know if we answered your question or if you have more, but yeah, I imagine Chat GPT or any GPT model would be pretty good at optimizing Docker. I, I'm guessing I've not tried it, but I assume it would be quite good at doing it. So. Yeah, but but uh, optimizing, right? Not not necessarily producing an optimal one, right? From like from the first attempt, it may because I have a feeling that it would end up uh, producing pretty much what you can find in this top Google result. And then if you ask us, is it optimal? It may end up with a very different, uh, you may end up with a very different Docker file. But for that, you need to have this kind of gut feeling that the, like, the original one is not that optimal. So even with ChatGPT, uh, it's a great thing, but you need to know what to ask it about to use it efficiently. Actually, one more question from KR. So we should not stuff too much in one layer using here docs docker file 1.4 format is that correct i actually don't know the answer to that one are your audio dropped there pierre could you say that again oh yeah so uh care was asking so we should not stuff too much in uh one layer using here docs docker 1.4 format is that correct uh it, it depends i'm a talk i'm assuming what they're talking about is uh, yeah yeah then you know, uh, you know the syntax where you can literally just put like uh, a basket into it um, if i'm wrong please correct me and it, it comes down to like the caching like if you're just doing an app update app install engine x a couple of system packages it's okay to stuff them into one layer that that's perfectly fine it's when you have 
build inputs that change and can bust the entire cache that you need to be a lot more specific about the layering itself. So the men, like all these run statements are fine, right? Because they're never ever going to be cache invalidated unless I specifically bust the cache or delete the cache from the server. They will never ever run again, right? Unless I change the build arc here for Proto C, but let's ignore that. The only thing that's going to invalidate my cache here is this copy statement down here. When we have an input, that says, okay, this is now changed. And then we have to get very specific about what happens afterwards. So if you want to use a here doc syntax to build a bash script into it, go nuts, like that's fine. Cool. But don't forget to put a set minus E at the beginning of this uh, here doc, because that's a very easy one, like to ruin your day, because uh, this uh, run with a here doc format, it will not fail your run step unless you put this set minus e there explicitly. If one of the e commands e fail, and pipe fail. let's get them all in there. Come on, good practice. I'm not sure like the, if all of them work in Docker file, but minus e is the most important one. It will if you change your shell to be one that is not posix. <laughs> yes, that's another trick. Yeah, that's, that's how you become a container expert. <laughs> Or pretend to be one in my case, but that's okay. Uh, I'm gonna just issue a quick disclaimer on. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't even remember what we're doing now. So, um, <laughs> I I, I think, so we did questions. something with Slim, I think. Right. Okay. Yeah. Does anyone here have content that they've created where they talk about how to create a terrible Docker file? I feel like that's a that's a really cool learning experience, reverse learning experience. <laughs> There's, uh, so I wrote an article for uh, Ambassador Labs in 2015 that still gets an absolute huge amount of traffic. Um, the title is How how Not to Be the Engineer Building a 3.5 Gig Docker Image. Um, <laughs> and there was another really great, it's not the reverse one, like you're specifically asking for, but um, Sid Palas on Twitter uh, had a really great thread last week where he actually takes a Docker file he found on Google and then goes through it line by line. It's like, okay, this is the problem here, and this is how we optimize it. Um, I will find both of those links and send them across to Peter for the show notes. Awesome. Nice. Thanks. Awesome. Yeah, Russ Rodriguez says, I bet Chat GPT would produce a Docker file that wouldn't build just as much as it would deliver an efficient one. So, yeah, yeah, some skepticism about uh, Chat GPT there. I will say, I it got me far along on a GitHub action I was building the other weekend, but that. To be fair, that GitHub action didn't run, so maybe you're on something there, Russ Regas. <laughs> so, um, may have been user error. So, okay, David. So we're we're doing a chat. We're doing a gRPC app. We found the Docker file online. We just <laughs> took it, said, "Great, run it." Uh, and now we're going to look into okay, what what do we have to do to make this uh, kind of production ready and get it into better shape? Great. Thank you for the reminder. So, <laughs> I do a Docker image LS and grab for gRPC, we have the large version of this container image. So it's 1.29 GB. Now, I know this is a static Go binary. We could add a new layer and just copy the Go binary. But again, I'm, I wanted to come at this one from the angle of, I have not been writing Docker files for any substantial amount of time. I'm not a DevOps professional. I am just a developer that wants to ship my code. So we're not going down there. Okay, let's optimize it. However, Lem, Lem. But also, let, uh, this one is also not that simple. If you start uh, on the second layer, or oh, sorry, the second uh, stage in your Docker file and copy just the build result, because the main problem, I guess, with this Docker file is that you will end up having the whole Go compiler and all its dependencies in your final image, even though you don't need them like at all. You just need your kind of binary and that's it. But if you, even if you like are aware of this issue and you start this uh, second stage and you copy your file, from what image are you going to start it? Like from scratch? Well, you are going to like run into a bunch of problems sooner or later with this approach. Um, and if you start it just from Debian, then you are in a very similar situation as with the original uh, stage. You will have a lot of things that aren't really needed for your application and that are vulnerable at the same time. So even multi-stage builds aren't that simple. You need to know uh, some tricks 
how to get them done well yeah. efficiently. Exactly. So I just wanted to show off the lint command um, because I thought this was cool. So you can run uh, a slim lint and then point it to the Docker file. So this isn't even looking at a container image. This was purely analyzing my Docker file. And from here, we get a report. And if we scroll down, it's got some advice. So it's like, hey, you don't have a Docker ignore file. So from there, okay, so if I don't know what Docker ignore file is, I can go and Google it. But it's a way for me to say that I don't want these certain files to end up in my build context, which is great for those .get directories or for any build output directories or binaries, et cetera. Um, it also tells me that we have unnecessary layers from run instructions. So maybe we should be chaining some of these together. And I just thought that was a nice little touch when I found that sub command that you know, we get this ability to take a look at what we're doing. And this is JSON, so I can then use the GitHub action to pull out the actual individual tips and put them into a comment. And we get this nice pull request feedback thing. So lots of flexibility there. Um, but let's go through the slim process then. So if I run just slim it, and I think it's slim it this time and not slim, uh, we've got the command that we already covered, right? So we're targeting the big image, we're including the shell, we're showing the clogs, we're turned off the HTTP probe, and we're publishing the ports. Why are we publishing the ports? Well, this isn't an HTTP application, it's a gRPC application. So if we want to be able to consume the application, we have to consume it with gRPC, which means I need the port to be available for me to send those requests. Uh, now, when we disable the HTTP probe, I don't know what the official name is here, but we get this manual probe step where we get this red output that says, you need to go and use this application and let me know when you've done it. And that's the sensor is just going to monitor all of the touch points with that application. Uh, and then we close it down and it finishes. So now I do have an IP address for this machine and I have Postman running. Oh, this is going to be tiny. That's a lot better. Yeah. Let me put down one. So here we're just uh, putting an IP address of the server. Um, the expose port is 8080 because in the Docker file, I have expose 8080. Uh, it's detected that uh, we have a st greeter service with a say hello. Now, this isn't detected from reflection on the binary. I don't have that enabled. Um, this is from me uh, clicking provide service definition and pointing it to the proto file that I have in my machine. So you know you still need to have access to the profile or enable reflection on the Google binary. Either or is fine. So David, I, I might just be, I might just be kind of dumb here, but like, I, maybe you could just give me some quick context on gRPC because I thought I understood it up until what you just started saying. <laughs> like <laughs> gRPC, like like how is gr? What are the main differences between gRPC and like you know RESTful or like an HTTP? Just like the the super explain it like I'm five version of of that. So gRPC, uh, so REST is HTTP based. Um, we use HTTP verbs, get, post, patch, put, et cetera. And we can hit uh, paths on the API and we can send in a request and we get a response back. gRPC is similar, except it doesn't use HTTP. It uses its own binary protocol with protobufs as the underlying messaging syntax. <coughs> um, you speak to one single endpoint and you say that I want to speak to this service and trigger this um, function, this endpoint, and here's my message. The message is not like a JSON message. It's binary encoded, positional based on the number of bytes in the message. This is how protobus work. I'm not intelligent enough to go and describe that in any more detail than that. But essentially, we have an endpoint. We send a, a binary payload, and we say this is for this service in this endpoint or this service oh, okay. in this um, function depending on the and the idea is that it's like safer because you're not like passing as much kind of like information before the before the endpoint and i'm kind of riffing here but like is is the advantage of grpc that it's more specific or that it's more secure or that it's um like more precise i guess it's a security that. standpoint and then it's a binary protocol so it's uh it's very difficult for people to fabricate payloads to kind of mm -hmm. bombard it with it you know if you get a probe of payload that's not if it doesn't fit the format for that endpoint it's just going to reject it um yeah but like it does not make like security but security is not a way right 
um, like if it, if you are sending data over HTTPS, you are in a much more secure position, and it doesn't really matter what you use on, under the, under the hood. Uh, and I'm sure if, if someone wants to reverse engineer your gRPC protocol, they will be pretty successful if they have like right, the right motivation. Well, yeah, um, a lot of gRPCs have reflection enabled. You can actually just say, "Tell me all your endpoints and your message types." So, yep. Okay. Yeah, but I, I know, like for me as a developer, the main difference is uh, uh, like in a mental model, let's say, behind it, because when uh, it's a REST uh, API, I, I think in terms of nouns, my uh, like endpoints are nouns, and, and uh, like users or like profiles or I don't know, images, and then I just um, have actions against them, and I have a very limited number of actions. It's like the standard HTTP verbs, like I can list my uh, users, I can get one user, I can create one by sending a post request, while the gRPC, uh, it's more like uh, method-based, so you don't have uh, nouns and some limited number of actions against them. You just define methods, like in your mm -hmm. programming language, uh, like in your clusters, you just define like, do this, do that. Uh, and then uh, you define them in a proto file, which is kind of close to a Golang file from the syntax standpoint. And then you just ask the compiler to produce uh, the actual code in your favorite programming language for this definition of the API. Um, and that's it. And that's how you get, well, an API between two endpoints, which is which looks like a normal class-based uh, like message passing interface. Yeah, that's the main selling point for me. Like the code generation for any language is the big selling point. And like you don't even realize you're crossing a network boundary because a lot of the code that it generates looks yep. like function calls, right? You're yep. like in my code, I'm just calling greeter.say hello. I don't know that it lives on this other machine somewhere else, essentially. So yep. um, it changes the way that we work. And it's also more correct because of the code gen. There's not humans coming in and typing and stuff. So mm -hmm. cool. It's it's nice. Cool. Uh, so yeah, we have uh, this message. I click invoke. Uh, maybe it'll work. Is it still running? No. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Too many questions about gRPC, and we took calls to time out. So. All right. Uh, just slim. Uh, probably still running. Start it again. Okay, port 8080. Let me grab the IP address in case that's changed. Back to Postman. Changed. There we go. And now we got a message back then. Hello, world. But obviously, this is kind of contrived. Um, I mean, it's a real gRPC service, it's doing stuff. But this is just me creating a single one-shot gRPC request. But you know, this is Postman, and you know, there are other tools out there where you would have an entire collection like this that hits every endpoint, sends the correct messages, tests the full API, and you could run this entire collection against this endpoint um, and get that kind of good coverage across the banner. Again, it's Go, so it's a single binary; it's not that big a deal. But if this was a more interpreted language, you would want to make sure that you cover a lot of those endpoints. So now we can come back to here, the manual probe, whatever the real name is, we say enter to say that we're done, and we get our new image. And if we grab gRPC, um, we've taken the Google image that we found from 1.3 gig, and we've got a 20, less than 24 meg image out the other side. Wow. And of course, we can, you know, we haven't really done this for any of them yet, but why don't we run it? And, uh, mm -hmm. Make sure that works. Not that I don't trust you, but you know. <laughs> but that's very important. Thing. Part of the demo. Like, yep. It's of, <laughs> it doesn't run. It's not it's yeah. successful. So, yeah. If we do a container run on gRPC Slim, we come back here, we hit invoke, and we're still getting our response. If we shut yeah. it down, it spins. Yeah. 
Oh. Well, I think, yeah, I think what you're showing is a really good approach, uh, whether, um, you know, you're using the Slim Toolkit or the Slim SaaS platform. So uh, we talked last week with Nuno about um, some of our community images that we just launched on the Slim DevOps uh, GitHub page. And we actually use Newman, which is like Postman, but like, you know, kind of a, uh, I think, an open source Java based, JavaScript based uh, rendition of it. Um, and that's how we run all of our tests. And so when we run these community images, we run the test suites in Newman that does the probing or this, the exercising of the container. And then we run that same slimmed container against the test suite again, you know, and that's kind of how we, we advocate people use our tools is like run it while you're developing this profile on what you're going to take out of the container, then run that same test again on the slim container and make sure that it's, that it's doing what it's supposed to do. And it should pass both of those, you know, so. Yeah, definitely. I think it's a really good approach. And as I was exploring, this, the one that definitely resonated with me as well. So cool. 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 Oh, and you're actually, did you shell into the slim container? Is that what you just did? I uh, know. I just control seed it. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> but there, but there is a shell because I used the include shell flag. So there, it, there is one there. Uh, if we had time, you know, we could save that Docker container as a Tarzip extract bit and take a look, but we don't need to go poking around. So. Yeah. Oh, by the way, do you do you have a Docker desktop installed? On my local machine? Uh, yeah. yeah. But I'm not on my, I'm on a Equinix metal, bare metal super machine. Oh, okay. With, yeah. Well, we don't have a fancy. Ram, so. <laughs> yeah, that's an amazing machine. I mean, why dev on my local laptop when I have access to wonderful bare metal? So. <laughs> nice. Yeah. No, well, I, I totally agree. <laughs> I, I have a couple of them myself. Um, but uh, why, why I brought up uh, Docker desk, uh, like a desktop, like any kind of desktop, I guess, is because of um, our Docker desktop extension. And it has a very cool um, UI, not to just introspect and see what's inside of your image, but also to compare any two images. And it's a very um, kind of uh, interesting exercise to, com to compare the uh, original image and the slimmed version of it. Uh, I'm sure, especially, um, like, I, uh, in this case, the difference will be huge. Like, you remove 99% of the original image. But that uh, Rust example where you slimmed um, an already slim Debian buster um, to an image that just contains your CLI, that would be, I'm sure, a very um, like representative thing to, to see in this uh, extension. Nice. I'll definitely check that out. Yep. Do recommend. Cool. Are well, we okay for um, time? Uh, yeah, I think we're okay for time. I know we have one more that we wanted to look at, but I know that we also know that that one uh, was having a few issues that we might need to uh, take a quick look at. So I think like we've got about probably, let's call it 10, 15 minutes. Um, if people are interested in what we're doing, so just want to say one, we'll be back with the same crew next week, same time at 3 PM. So please join us for our, our stream. Then we'll be looking a bit more at some of the slim platform tools that we're working on. Um, and, uh, we have a discord server that if you go to slim.ai above my head, you can find the link to discord. Um, it's kind of all over the site. Uh, please join us there. We're all kind of in discord and you can chat with us and, and get more information about what we're doing here. Um, at Slim. Of course, Rock Code has his own Discord server, which is amazing. I'm in it. I learn a lot about Rust in there, so so please join that as well. Um, and uh, OK, are saying, uh, this is my favorite part of David's screen, a 48-core machine. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, <laughs> definitely, definitely. Like, I mean, you know, we'll have to run some chat GPT just locally on, on David's machine at some point. So. <laughs> Um, <laughs> cool. All right. So what's the last demo that we're getting into and let's, we'll be, be open and transparent about the bug we found at the last minute, um, here. So, yeah, uh, so the last thing I wanted to, I was already having too much fun, like exploring <laughs> with all these third party things and the gRPC and I was like, right, okay, I'm kind of sold, but what if I want to not retrofit it, but you know, we we'll use this against something that is a real project of mine. And I have my website, which I've been working on for far too long and it's still never finished, but you know, that's just the way software goes. Um, and it's a Node.js application. I have a Docker file um, because my standard deployment goes to Cloudflare and um, pages and workers. 
So I don't build container images for it. I just let Cloudflare handle it. But I thought, well, what if, what if I did? What would that look like? And again, I didn't write my own. Um, I went to Google and I said, give me a Docker file for a, a Node.js Astro build project. And this is what we got. Um, pulling in from Node LTS. I had an Azure runtime. I didn't remove it. I don't know why it's there because it's the only layer. But again, people. this is how people discover Docker files. Oh, mm -hmm. my, did my camera just turn up? Yeah. yeah, I think so. I think we might have just lost your camera. We can still hear you, though. So. Oh. That's annoying. Uh... Yeah, that's what happens when you stream at 10 p.m. Hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, so. yeah. I think family that turned I... it off on you. <laughs> David, you're done. <laughs> I think the battery is depleting faster than it can charge with the cable in, I'm afraid. Oh, so. uh, OK. <laughs> Okay. I'll give it a minute and I'll turn it back on. But and I, I tried to use continuity camera, but that thing never works. Like it's actually not showing up as a device at all. What? How would I ever get that to work on their Mac? I don't know. No, I've I've tried it, but yeah, it's it's never worked for me either. My my camera has a tendency to do what yours just did too. So. All right. Okay. We'll give it a minute and I'll I'll, I'll flick it back on. Um. So yeah, this has a as runtime. It's naming the layer. I don't know why, but again, I wanted to kind of iterate that. I believe most people are going to get the Docker file by just going to Google and say, give me a Docker file for this project. And I didn't really want to change too much. The one thing I did add myself was the core pack stuff because I don't use NPM, I use PNPM. So I just had to add that to make sure it was available. <laughs> this. So you made it worse. I made it worse, yes, exactly. <laughs> um, this Docker file, again, number one hit on Google. Straight in there with the copy dot dot. You know, we don't want to see this, especially for a Node.js application where we can pull in the package JSON, do the npm install, cache the node no, modules to the directory. No install, please. Yeah. It's npm CI. Yes, okay. Yeah. We should be using clean install, of course. My bad. I'll slap myself on the wrist. <laughs> <laughs> or use npm and not have to worry about it, right? So. I'll give, a, I'll give a shout out to uh, Nina, who is going to be at the Cloud Native Rejects conference right before KubeCon EU, giving a talk that goes over some security best practices for Dockerfile um, uh, using Node as an example. So uh, if you all be at Cloud Native Rejects, check out Nina's talk there. So. Thank you for the shout out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, learn all about NPM CI and uh, you know, caching layer efficiency for, for Node applications like this. So. But go ahead, go ahead. So, David, this is Astro. Is it that you? I didn't realize that you built Raw Code Academy in Astro. That's my personal blog is also in Astro. Just so you know, um, which I've shared on stream before. I'm sure our our, our viewers know this. But um, all right, uh, nice. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Astro because I don't like React. I really like Svelte, and I did go down the Svelte kit route for a while. Um, but then there's always that one React component that exists yeah. that doesn't exist in Svelte, and I was like, you know what? I'm just Astro came out and I was like, okay, this is the one. I can just pick and choose the ones. Yeah. Plus, web components are something I'm really interested in. I think like having native web components and browsers and doing more there instead of using these other people. Don't want to deviate down the front end path today. We can have another. <laughs> on that. We've had, we had a big debate about web components on stream when I did my Astro project, but I actually got to Astro the same way. I was trying to learn Spelt, got kind of frustrated with Spelt Kit, found Astro, was like, okay, I can use. Spelt when I want to and other stuff when I don't. So yeah, it's pretty yeah. cool. Definitely worth checking out. Like I've only pulled in two React components or something, but you know, it was nice that they were there and there wasn't anything in Spelt that was the same. So uh, really, really smart piece of kit. Wait, so first, so, I want to make sure I understand this. First, you said npm install, and now you're saying you don't like React. This is like strike two. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> We don't try to turn my camera back off. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Next stream's going to get interesting when we're when we're trying to do a uh, slim platform and we end up talking about front end uh, Java uh, JavaScript frameworks for the whole time, which is totally I think okay. React got a lot better with hooks, especially around state, and there's not as much prop drilling. But you still like the whole context API. I find just overly complicated, which is why Svelte was very appealing to me. The way that they handle bindings for state is is pretty clever. But yeah, um, we could talk about it. I keep going. So <laughs> Go on, we've got a PMPM install. We do a run build. We've got some ENV stuff. I added the expose three thousand. I no, no, that was still already there. That was fine. Um, and then the command nodes. So what's important about this Docker file is one, I 
changed very little. It came from Google. I think most people are doing this. Secondly, look at the command. Right? We're doing a build step. We're generating a disk directory. The only thing I need in my final image is that disk directory. Yeah, we have this entire Node LTS runtime image with the Node modules that we still don't even need because everything's been bundled together into this distribution directory. Um, so I was like, hey, <laughs> I mean, I, I knew when I built the image, it was going to be huge, but I wasn't sure exactly how big. And uh, if we do a quit and do a Docker image LS grip website, see, because this is a remote machine, I don't have access to my Rust grip, but, you know, well, I'll just put it there. <laughs> and we get a 1.64 gig image. I mean, I can tell you, because I distribute this to Cloudflare multiple times per day when I make changes, my website is like, 12 meg, maybe 16 meg or something like that. I can't remember exactly. In my building, uh, over one and a half gig Docker image, and it's because Google told me to. So. <laughs> um, so this is the part. This this has been working for two weeks, but today it did stop working. Just need to say a prayer to the demo gods, burn some incense, whatever, uh, <laughs> show our clogs, whatever we need to do to make the demo work. Yeah, so typically I just do slim build, point it to the image, and it works. Now, what we're going to see is that we actually see the HTTP probe doing some really cool things. Although, where it is. Wait a second, let's enable the uh, glog thingy uh, before we proceed. You want clogs? Yep. Show our clogs. <laughs> uh, and what we're going to see is the HTTP probe doing what it does best, which was the most fascinating part for me. So it started the container, it's now doing the probe, and we're going to see it spit out every asset, every web page on my website. And I thought that was awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, but then we do get, unfortunately, an error. Mm -hmm. um, annoying, but I think we can fix it. <laughs> we, we, so indeed. Uh, we, we, uh, so I, I think it's really. <laughs> I cannot really see this uh, screen. It's too small for me and too blurry. But um, I have a feeling that the error happens when we try to copy some Node.js uh, package related um, like stuff. Uh, how about trying one of those uh, include flags for Node.js? Maybe it will fix it. Yes. So what we can do just, is. The folder or the Node modules folder, maybe? Well, it shouldn't be including, well, it shouldn't have to include node modules. This should actually never be used, which is why, yeah, I don't know why actually, because only the test is used. Um, but let's find that include flag. We can do include path and just include that entire directory. No, wait a second. It. There are some uh, not just related uh, includes, uh, look for something more specific. Because include path is uh, like an expert level flag. When you we're, know we're experts, <laughs> we are. Uh, but <laughs> but we're trying to, to like um, I guess to show like a simple solution here. So uh, unless you you don't mind, of course. Russ says, um, I'm just uh, one point six gigabyte has got to be close to a full Linux desktop install, which is probably pretty close. Yeah. Yeah. I think the typical Node LTS is like one point two gigabytes, which we use quite a bit. So yeah. Um, and so just for people who are watching on stream, um, these include flags are a way to explicitly tell Slim Toolkit to include either a a file or a set of file, a path of files. And it's usually a good first debugging step if you have something in your Slim container that's breaking. Um, usually it's like taking something out that um, it does need in it. Um, and I guess we don't necessarily know what that might be, so. I just had a thing go off in my head and now I need to confirm something. Uh... Did you just change, make some changes to the Docker file? I changed the PMPM to NPM because PMPM does some pretty special stuff with flattening the node modules directory and hoisting them out. But I don't think my website will build with NPM. So yeah, okay, that won't work. Um, so I thought that would be an easy fix. But unfortunately, we can't do that. So I think we may have to either include the NPM, the node modules directory, 
or use the flag that Ivan suggested, which is to include a single node module package that seems to be failing, which from the debugging we did earlier is the DOM utils package, right? Yeah, so you know, it looks like uh, in the meantime, one of these NPM packages, and I'm sure you have lots of them in your Node.js, uh, Node package, not modulus folder, it, it got updated and it may have like a, some fancy symlink or, or something like that. And, and, and somewhere in our uh, like logic where we do copy all these files while producing the hardened image or the optimized image, um, we probably mess up with this uh, like, let's say less conventional folder structure. And that's why I wanted to include the folder fully, which is rarely a good idea, um, just to try disabling this code path that, that fails. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, just from a like kind of a testing perspective or whatever, just to be explicit about what's happening with including the node model. So it's not a good idea because you're actually then carrying all that node weight all of those files that you didn't necessarily need so it's not good from an optimization standpoint however from like a debugging standpoint it is kind of a an interesting approach to take because now you're just basically saying like keep all the application stuff that i need and maybe try slimming the os and we can see if mm -hmm. if that helps helps things um go yeah just just something weird <laughs> Russ, Russ says, my, my theory is Rocco is trying to get you all to fix an issue with his site that he has. <laughs> <laughs> it's a free debugging of the Rocco Academy website. Um, sure, yeah, we'd have, be happy to do it. So. Yeah, I, this did work. I, re, I really, I don't know what's changed. I'm not, I'm sure it's probably something that I've done, but I, I can't pinpoint it. No, right. not, unlikely. Yeah. I think it just, you know, like the version upgrade. You probably don't have the versions pinned in your package JSON, and uh, something got upgraded to, like, you know, the next version. And, and mm -hmm. yeah. I'll actually, I'll actually, so I know we're, we're kind of coming up on time here, so I'll, I'll, I'll bring us out of there. Um, David, and we will absolutely help you debug uh, uh, anything on the website. But I think one thing that would be interesting, and this is a good segue for next time, would be to use that diff tool, um, either in the Slim platform or in the Slim Docker desktop extension, and kind of diff, uh, or, or maybe even like use those tools to get into the container itself and see what's in the fat container and see if there are these sim links or see if there's something going on with that node packages module. It could be a good first exploration. And maybe we could start there next time um, cause that's kind of like in the slim platform or, um, you know, if we could do it on the Docker desktop extension or something, um, start looking inside the container or gives us some better understanding of what's going on with the fat container that might help us fix the slim container. And then we can use that to jump into some of the, the tools and, and stuff like that, that we use on the slim platform side to do a lot of these same slimming contexts. So maybe that's a good, maybe we've left ourselves a good problem to solve for next time. And that suspense will get people coming back. I don't want to jump the gun, but I may have something working. Okay. <laughs> See, as soon as I take you off screen yeah. and then it works, uh, that's the that's the rule. Yeah. So, so I, I, I think Ivan is right. Uh, it's probably somebody is updated with one of the node packages. There probably is some weird hard link, soft link, sim link nonsense going on, and maybe it's PM. Not yeah, necessarily nonsense. Maybe we just haven't covered it in our code. Yeah. Um. So I removed the workspace reference, which was an optional dependency anyway. The npm install is now working. And if we get an npm run build, I'm curious if the slim will work, which would confirm mm. the problem maybe with the pmpm planning of the node modules directory. Uh, of course, now we're relying on npm, which nobody likes waiting for. Um, pmpm does finish this install in about six seconds, just for the record. So. Um, Nina and I have a common, like, we, we might need to get a poster of this, but that's like, you know, build time is talk time. So people who are watching in chat, give us your questions now, you know, that's, this is where we have to fill dead space on the stream all the time, which is like during the, the builds, <laughs> especially the node LTS builds. So, um, <laughs> but, yeah, I um, hope none of y'all had yeah, memes no. at half past the hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hope you didn't. Um, yeah, no, I, it, it's an interesting point that like, it just shows sort of how fragile like supply chain security and supply chain in general and sort of like being like, you know, just dependency management 
can be because that's what all of this stuff is supposed to help with right at docker you know you get these you know kind of stacked builds and stuff like that but you know and, and you can go you know pin all your dependencies and then bump those versions but that has a lot of manual effort as well and so here we had a working demo 10 days ago when we did the video for this 10 days later some low level dependency has changed and now you know it's kind of wreaking havoc across what would be like a, a ci cd pipeline or a, a deployment pipeline and this is like a real problem this is like what people face every day so yeah, yeah thank you don't pin your dependencies and your builds break, you pin your dependencies and vulnerabilities creep in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the answer then? <laughs> Slim AI, no, I don't know. <laughs> don't, don't pin and pardon. I mean, that's a fair play. Like don't pin, keep updating, but don't forget uh, taking a look at the end result. I mean, I very rarely even commit a log file um, because I always want the latest to greatest. Like I'll I'll set my, my dependencies to be put in any 2.4 minor version. And I always want the latest to greatest. So I never really worry about log files in that regard because, you know, we have a container process that does a build and I run the tests again. If that passes, I don't care if it's 2.4.1 or 2.4.9. Um, and I know a lot of people are always like, yeah, but then you end up with this situation where the install doesn't work anymore. And it's like, yeah, but you're going to have to fix that eventually. So why not? Like when it happens, like when it's one package. I mean, I remember like when I worked for a company called Team Rock 2015, you know, we did a lot of kind of web development stuff then. And we deployed once every two weeks, maybe. And even the time in those two weeks, you could get like... 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 node package update. And like, that's a lot to work through. And I've always just been like, I'm never doing that again. And I'll do it. I'll, I'd rather do it one by one often than regularly, but have to deal with 30 different packages I'm updating. I don't know if that makes sense yeah. outside of my head, but it's just, I, I don't commit log files and I prefer just to get the latest and greatest whenever possible. So. Yeah. Like the pain of updating a cruise, right? I think is what you're saying is like, if you do it, you know, like, once a day or something if you're always getting the latest and greatest and then it breaks on the update right then you just have to fix it then right and so then you're doing a lot of little 15 minute 30 minute you know kind of fixes whereas if you just pin everything and hold and wait you're still going to spend the same amount of time but it's going to be like a day or two days worth of work to to get all of those updates um when you have to do them yeah and then what if there's a regression in your software and like you have to update one package which updates more than one package and then there's a whole bunch of conflicts there and then the hot fix that you wanted to get out within 30 minutes because of some security issue you're spending two days trying to fight dependency health to get over it like it's always better to handle these things as quickly as possible and and my experience in the past russ russ has a dissenting opinion in chat he says uh, <coughs> pin and scan for vulnerabilities in your ci system so i do think it is like you know, there are different, there are good reasons to do either of these, right? It's a little bit more of like an engineering philosophy, engineering management philosophy kind of kind of question, but it doesn't mean, I think I see this too often as like, there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. And then, you know, people are like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is the right way and this is the wrong way, but then they say opposite things, so. Yeah, I mean, we have a lot of dogmatism when it comes to opinions and tech, right? And there's always the West side over here says do this, this side does this. And the truth is always somewhere in the middle. And I think the better, the more experience that we get, the more quickly we kind of establish where we need to be. And that's later kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Wow, this is like 400 seconds long NPM yeah, install now. <laughs> this, is, this is definitely a long build for, uh, even for Node. Um, even for Maybe, maybe not, not, not an FTP. <laughs> need to parallelize it across the cores uh, let's see if we can i feel like it might be close because we did get some output at least let's let's give it yeah. another 20 seconds all right russ says if your prod system is arch linux then go for latest everything but i can't tell if that's a joke or not so <laughs> <laughs> that's not a joke that's truth like rolling destros of the future <laughs> Oh, oh, says, the Ar says the Arc Linux user is running on a Mac at the moment, but whatever. <laughs> nice. Macs just make video stuff easier, right? I mean, I would rather run Linux, but I want my webcam and microphone to work. So. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, 
always have audio problems on this stream and I always blame Ubuntu. It's not exactly fair. It's uh, that I don't know how to use Ubuntu. It's clearly <laughs> the problem, but um, it has nothing to do with Ubuntu itself. Oh, that's oh, rubbish. No, the worst. 400 second build with a error timeout that's like... Uh, and no error message. <laughs> oh, no. Wait. That's the universe I... telling us that <laughs> don't do anything. Properties of... Oh, well, never mind. Oh, well. Um... <laughs> All right. Well, next stream, I think, uh, you know, so next stream we'll be looking at the Slim CLI, which Ivan and our team has has built and put together. Uh, it is not the same Slim Toolkit. It's a different CLI. It, it interacts with the Slim Portal. David's going to take it for a spin on a few different um, examples, and we'll find out what we learn about that. Maybe we can uh, resolve this uh, PNPM issue. Uh, with the raw code website and get a slimmed version of that out using our um, SAS platform. So um, that is what we will do next time. Um, thanks so much, David. This has been great. I mean, I think like, you know, really insightful. I, I mean, I learned a lot. It's like Slim's open source project. I learned a ton from it. So, uh, you know, I was really, really interested and thanks for coming on and sharing it with us. Um, yeah. Uh, any closing Yeah, thank you for having me. Side? Yeah. Uh, no, just, you know, if, if anyone's watching and they've been curious about Slim and haven't kind of dived into it yet, like, I had a whole lot of fun. And, uh, you know, like, for the majority of everything I wanted to do, it just worked. I actually think it made me think about my test cases for software yeah. better because I was always thinking about, okay, what the, what does my acceptance test criteria need to be to run against this? Um, again, mostly for, like, Python, Perl, PHP, Node.js, interpreted languages, where you do need to run across various modules and stuff. Um, and for the static binary, not even the static binary stuff, just for any single binary application, whether it's static or shared libraries, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it, it just worked. And, like, there was a lot of value from just hooking that up and pushing the image. So, um, yeah, I mean, I had a lot of fun playing with the flags, but I think it's important for people to know they're they're not scary, and you don't really need them. They're just there in case you're of that curious mind, which was, was very cool. I had a lot of fun. Cool, cool, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Evan. Any uh, any any thoughts on your side from what you saw, David? Kind of kind of working on. No, that, that was oh, like very cool, and it's always great to see where something breaks because it's a great opportunity for us to improve it and make it even more universal. Uh, because I am sure that the first versions of this tool were breaking probably like in ninety percent of the cases, and now it's uh, the inverse distribution of success rate versus failures, and um, like it's up to us to even improve it further. So keep hacking, folks. It's fun. Cool. Awesome. Nina, any final thoughts on your side? I just wanted to say thank you all as well. It was cool to walk through all those different examples. I learned a bit more about Docker files in general um, and also about some of the commands that we have in our CLI. So it's great. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Sounds good. Well, we'll be back here same time next week, Thursday at 3 p.m. Uh, thank you so much to Russ and KR and everybody who is watching. Uh, people who are watching and have questions, please uh, say hi in chat. We're a friendly group. And um, yeah, give us a follow and we will back, be back here uh, next week with the same group. So thanks so much and we will see you next time. Bye. See you all then. Thank you. Thanks.